Thank you, Dean Davies. And I also want to take a moment to thank the outstanding dispute resolution faculty here. So Professor Cole, Professor Froelich, Professor Lee, thank you so much for this warm welcome and good afternoon, Ohio State. I am thrilled to be here delivering the Lawrence Lecture. I'm frankly also thrilled to be out of my house <laughs> wearing real pants on stage for the first time, frankly, since November of 2019. It's been a time of tremendous change and upheaval. And my hope for you is that you're going to find a bit of what I found during this time, that while there were many, many challenges, it built my resilience, my flexibility, my grit to handle whatever comes my way in the negotiation room. And speaking of which, that's what we're here to talk about here today. So those of you who are here and are going to be competing, congratulations. I hope to give you tools, as Dean Davies said, not only for this competition, that are going to help you for the rest of your life. That's my goal. All right, with that, let's ask for more. So I wanted to start by talking about how I was taught negotiation and why I no longer teach it. So I'm wondering how many of you absorb this same tired old definition of negotiation that I learned when I was in law school and indeed in my first couple of years of practice as a lawyer. That negotiation was basically a back and forth, usually over money, to get to an agreement. And I'll be honest, when I thought about negotiation that way, I thought, you know, as a junior lawyer, I'm really not going to be doing much. Because negotiation is only when you go in to ask for more salary, right? When I go into Dean Lester and say, hi, published a book this year, won an award, keep me in mind when you're making your salary negotiation. We didn't do that in my firm. It was lockstep, right? Or I thought that negotiation was what I did with a client right before we signed a retainer agreement or before we signed an m and And as a junior associate, I wasn't doing much of that either. Or unfortunately, negotiation is what you do when you get into court and you have to figure out a way to settle out. And over time, I looked at this and I thought that this seemed more and more narrow, limited, and frankly, reactive, right? As though we only negotiate when the circumstances force it upon us. I no longer teach this. I teach this. <laughs> so this is actually an homage to the place that I really learned how to negotiate, which was in Hawaii on my honeymoon. <laughs> and no, it wasn't because I married another lawyer, although that certainly didn't help. It's because I found myself in a kayak on the Wailua River in Kauai, don't know if anybody's been there, on this tour, and our guide looked back at us and said, all right, guys, I want you to negotiate your kayaks this way. We're headed for that beach. And that was the moment that everybody else was drinking in the Hawaiian Sea. And my brain was somewhere else because I started thinking, that's right. There's another way to think about it, isn't there? If I'm negotiating my kayak toward a beach, what am I doing? I'm steering. And in that moment, I thought to myself, what would my life look like as a lawyer, as a professional, as a person, as a woman, if I treated every conversation I had not just the money conversations, not just the deal conversations, and not just the salary conversation, but every conversation as an opportunity to steer that relationship in the way I was going, to teach them how to value me, and also to get to know them really well in return. And suddenly, as a junior associate, I looked around and I saw opportunities to negotiate everywhere. It wasn't just the retainer agreements with the client. It was all of those micro interactions that I would have with them throughout the week or the year. And it wasn't just negotiating for money. I realized there were other ways to steer my career. I could be asking for the work I wanted, the mentors I needed, the access that was necessary for me to the people, the places, the meetings, the information that was going to get me where I was going in my career as a lawyer. And that 
put me in the driver's seat for the rest of my life. And so, as you approach this competition, just know that this has a name. You know you're negotiating now. But I want you to start looking at all of the other interactions in your life to realize that those two are negotiation. They are steering. Okay, now, there's just one problem with this picture. I mean, this looks lovely, right? Relaxing, in fact. I don't know about for all of you, but since about March 6th of last year, my life has not looked like this. It's looked a little closer <laughs> to this, right? We're, maybe we're not on a honeymoon. Maybe we're not in a situation of abundance in our law practice, where we're just receiving the deals as they come in. Maybe we are, in fact, steering our kayak with our colleagues, with our bosses, with our you know, subordinates, with our clients, through category four rest. I want you to know that the approach I'm gonna teach you today works exceptionally well for this. This is when I wrote Ask for More. But this is when I've been traveling around virtually from my home office to places throughout the US and the world helping people and institutions to steer themselves through some of the most difficult times that any of us can remember. And it works exceptionally well for that also. So let's get to it. Negotiation is any conversation where you're steering a relationship. In every situation, you can be thinking about how do I steer this for mutual gain? Because I know you know this, but success in the law is a relationship sport. You don't just want to get somebody to sign one deal with you, right? If I'm working with Chica, I'm thinking about how do I make it so that Chica sees me as her partner in her long-term success? We're not just doing this deal. We're doing many deals down the road. You may have a one-time interaction in the Lawrence lecture, right, for your, for your competition, but your real life will never be a one-time interaction. Law practice, even in a large city, is very small. And the more you are in that practice, the more you will see people over and over again. And so if you are thinking about how you're going to get what you need, while also making sure that person can get what they need, that's when you're going to be the most successful in the long run. Now, last bullet here is the most important. You know what gets lost? when people think of negotiation as starting from the moment that Professor Lee and I sit down, we're losing most of what makes it work. The first negotiation in every situation is not with the person sitting across from you, it is with yourself. How many times have you told yourself no before you gave somebody else the chance? How many times have you censored, shut yourself down, or otherwise gotten yourself into a conflict in your head so you're not sure what to do. That is a sign that you need to steer that internal relationship. It's the most important relationship of your life. And if you get that right, that's your power in the negotiating room. Okay, so now that we know that negotiation is not just money, it's steering, what's the best way to steer? The answer might surprise you. And this answer comes from my more than decade of work as a lead. Because as a mediator, how many people are here are taking mediation? We have a number of folks, right? Okay. As a mediator, my job is not to go into the room and supply people with answers. My job is to ask the right question. And here's the secret that all of you are going to learn here today. The best way to negotiate for yourself is also to ask the right question. Okay, so what does asking questions have to do with negotiation? A tremendous amount. First of all, do you know that leadership, whether you're leading a negotiation team, whether you're leading a family, you're leading an institution, or you're leading a nation, leadership is correlated with asking yourself the right question. Because again, it's about self-awareness. All good leadership comes from self-awareness. And I want you to think now about the last person you remember who was a great leader. Chances are you're gonna tell me that that person was self-aware. They knew their strengths, they knew their weaknesses, they knew how they were coming across, they knew what they needed to work on. If 
I ask you to think about a really ineffective leader, chances are one of the words you would use to describe that person is clueless. They had no idea, right, of who they were and how they were coming along. Critically important for leadership to ask yourself the right question. And then, do you know, once you get in the room with somebody else, right? So if Lila and I are negotiating, what's the way that Lila gets the most money up front? What's the way she does the best at the table? It is actually not by coming in and unloading all the answers. It's by starting with asking me the right question. But what are those questions? We're going to find out. All right. So, um, oh, this skips ahead. So ask for more, as the dean was saying, is really just 10 questions, right? The book I wrote is 10 questions that I have used over and over again in my practice as a mediator at Columbia with many, many thousands of parties across all walks of life, all types of negotiations, and they are remarkably effective. So the first five questions are what I call the mirror, right? Remember we were talking about you're going to steer that conversation with yourself. That's how you do it. And then once you get in the room with somebody else, maybe for this competition, maybe for a job interview, which by the way, also a negotiation, maybe once you're in practice, right? You're going to be asking them those questions. And when you start there, that's how you're going to do that. Okay. So let's get to the mirror questions. I picked out two for you. The first one is one that I spoke to the Wall Street Journal last year when Ask for More was published. And they said, Alex, where does every negotiation start? And I said, it starts here. What's the problem I want to solve? I'll never forget a set of lawyers who came into me on a complicated financial case that we were meeting. And, you know, like lawyers, they were, they were constantly looking at their watches, right? And finally, 20 minutes in, to what is a really complex negotiation that was going to take a full day. The lawyer was like, you know, what are we doing all this background for? Like, aren't you going to help us solve this? And I said, solve what? That's the question, right? Most of your negotiation success. And do you know, most of your success in an institution, most innovation failures come from people solving the wrong problem. Okay, I want you to imagine that you're getting in your kayak and you're basically going to figure out which beach you're looking to hit, right, first, because otherwise you're going to be paddling all day and you're going to end up in the jungle. Let me give you a couple of examples of defining the right problem, all right? I got a call from a company that I advise, a startup company, early on during COVID, okay? They call me in May, same month my book is coming out, and they're like, we have a problem, we need your help. Um, a major segment of our business disappeared in the pandemic. We have a product. We sell through to multiple channels, including coffee shops. Coffee shops are dead. We're raising another round of financing later this year. We're short. We need revenue. So we need your help to blast the Rolodex because we're, we're hitting up 2,000 people to make our numbers for June. And I said, hold up. What is the problem we are trying to solve? is the problem we want to solve that we're looking to bring in any revenue for June, in which case, let's play this out. What if those are not your right clients? What if they leave, because you told me you have short-term contracts, and then we're doing this all over again for July, August, and September? Or is the question, how are we going to pivot your business? Who are your biggest long-term clients? Because if that's the problem we're trying to solve, we're not blasting the Rolodex of 2000, are we? we're sending targeted pitches to 10 people, right? Your problem to solve is your negotiation strategy. Everything else is tactics, okay? And I wanna give you one more example. Let's imagine me. something simple. Miari is going in, let's say she's at a firm and she wants to work on a particular project. She should still spend a minute thinking about what is the problem I want to solve here? Is it that I want to work with this lawyer because she's going to teach me something I need to know to advance? Is it that by raising my hand, I'm trying to demonstrate initiative and leadership potential so that I can be placed on the partner track? Is it because I find this client interesting 
And maybe eventually I'd like to go in house. And so this is going to help take a moment to figure out the broader picture. What's the problem you're looking to solve? If you do this before you go into this negotiation competition, right? If you really think about what you're going in to achieve, but also the bigger picture of what happens if I achieve that, that's when you're going to be the most persuasive and get the best results. Okay. Last question from the mirror section for you to ask yourself. I'm just going to take a quick informal poll. Okay. How many people have ever felt any anxiety or nerves before a negotiation? Okay, so look around, right? For those of you on Zoom, I'm not sure what you can see. Nearly everybody in the audience raised their hands, okay? And I should raise my hand too. All right, I, I got to tell you, do you know the best way to like get over your fear in negotiation? It's to write a book called Ask for More. <laughs> because every time you, you're tempted not to negotiate, you're like, oh God, I wrote Ask for More. I have to go in and do it. Okay, you're, if you've ever been anxious about it, here's a question that you need to ask yourself and write down the answer before you go into any negotiation. Here it is. How have I handled this successfully in the past? Too often, we go into a negotiation thinking about what went poorly last time, right? Last time we froze, last time we ran into a difficulty, last time we didn't know what to say or the other person reacted in a certain way, okay? I want you to flip that around. I want you to take a moment and think to yourself, when have I handled this or something like this before, right? Let's say you're approaching this negotiation competition and you're trying to get a great result. I want you to think back to the last time you achieved a great result by advocating for yourself. And then you're gonna write down in detail how you did it. Because here's the thing, let's say Gabs is gonna do this before she goes into the negotiation competition, right? When she takes a moment to write down how she's done this before, she does two things. Number one, she achieves what Columbia Business School professors proved to be a power prime on her brain. She is no longer just Mags. She is showing up as super Mags. The person who achieved that great victory before, it puts her brain back in that state if she writes it down. But the other thing this question does, it's a data generator. It helps you figure out what your best strategies are. And each one of you is going to have a different best strategy, your go-to, the things that work for you. Maybe Mags is an incredible negotiator because she creates rapport. And so she thinks back, she remembers that she connected with someone, and that's how she got a great result. Maybe her strength is in research. She had a ton of knowledge when she walked in the room, and that helped her to feel confident and relaxed, right? It's going to teach you things that I promise you, you can use. Now, some of you are thinking this. You're thinking, well, this sounds fine if I'm doing something that's similar to what I've done before. But what happens, Alex, if I've never done this thing before? Anybody? Okay, challenge accepted. <laughs> I want you to do this. I don't care what it's about. I want you to write down your proudest prior success. I don't care, maybe you were diabetic and you lost 70 pounds and kept it off, like one of my clients. Maybe you successfully beat cancer, you got through chemo. I'll never forget one woman who said, Alex, I'm leading a team for the first time in my life I don't have a prior success. And I said, fine, what are you most proud of in life? And she looked at me and said, my husband died and I raised two kids on my own. And I was like, well, that sounds like a team leader to me. So let's write down how you showed up to do that every day. And I have a feeling we're gonna find things that are gonna work for you. You will still get the brain benefit and you will also get a clue as to what your best strategies are as a human being, because let's face it, right? Weight loss, chemo, raising kids after the death of a spouse, all of that takes a heck of a lot of resilience, creativity, marshalling resources, and other skills that are phenomenally useful for negotiation. So next time you're going in, just write down what you're most proud of. And I'm telling you, it's gonna help, and I want you to write to me and tell me how it goes. All right, we're done with the mirror. All right, you've taken a few minutes to ask yourself some great questions. And now you're actually getting into the room with somebody. All right, you and Tyler are sitting down. You're going to talk to one another. 
and you're thinking, all right, I know I want to ask them questions because the research on questions in negotiation comes from Northwestern, Professor Lee Thompson. She actually found that only 7% of the people she studied knew how to ask the right question to get the most out of negotiation. And we're going to learn how to do that here today. So let's do it. I'm going to give you a chance, I got, to interview me. I think that's good enough. All right, so I'm here today to tell you that yes, I know we're still kind of in a raging pandemic, but I did in fact recently go on a family vacation. And you'd like to get some info from me about my family vacation. And um, I'm going to answer all your questions live, whatever you would like to ask. So I actually think, given the size of the room or whatever, that you might be able to raise your hand and just speak your question to me. I'll repeat it for the audience, and then I'll answer. All right. So step on up. You're the next contestant. Yes. Um, what was your favorite and least favorite part of your vacation? Wow. Okay. So technically, that's two questions. Um, so you're going to be an excellent lawyer. Well done. In, in fact, right? If you know, if you're really trained to be a lawyer, you need three or four subparts. Um, so I would say um, my favorite part of vacation was probably watching my daughter play with her little cousin. Um, so incredibly sweet and cute most of the time. And um, my least favorite part was um, probably the evening. And to keep it fair, I'm going to leave off your second question. Who's up next? Yes. Where did you go? I went to Cape Cod, Massachusetts. You're up in the back. You had the same one. Where'd you go? I'll get to you in a second. Go anyone else? Yes, you. How did you plan your agenda? How did I plan my agenda? That's a great question. Some of it was planned for me because it felt like every client on earth called me and they were like, can you do a keynote Labor Day weekend? Like, oh, geez. All right. So some of that I, I did. Um, and then others of it, I would say, was dependent on um, the stamina of the little one, um, nap schedule. And some of it was dependent on my father's schedule, so how we schedule things. Yes, I think your hand is up. I was going to ask, what do you value in a vacation? What do I value in a vacation generally? Um, for me, I'm like very, very busy. I value most like rest and unplugging. I also like physical exercise, which helps me rest. So like a, a, like a hike in the morning or something like that would be perfect for me. Yes. Can you explain to me what was difficult about the evenings? Can I explain what was difficult about the evening? All right, what was difficult about the evening? Um, what was difficult was that was a time when I was alone with my thoughts and I was reflecting on the day. Um, and sometimes that was the only time I had to kind of process things. And um, I had a hard time sleeping as a result. Yes. Welcome back, Professor Carter. Tell me everything about your vacation start uh, to finish. Thank you, <laughs> Ringer. OK. So I'd love to tell you all about my family vacation. Every year, um, my family goes to my dad's side of the family goes to Cape Cod. Uh, it's where my dad and stepmom live. And we have a family reunion of sorts. It, it started right around the time I got married when they threw us an engagement party and my brothers came, everybody came. And we've been doing it every year religiously. And um, this year has been different on a couple of fronts. With the pandemic, we had a more limited group uh, come. People were vaccinated and could you know, drive and all that. Um, but it was also different because my father no longer lives at home. He has a terminal brain disease. And so I was visiting him every day in his hospice facility or outside his hospice facility where we would have outdoor visits. And 
watching my daughter and my brother's little daughter like liven his spirits and liven all of our spirits frankly like kept us going during that time and i think the most challenging part of this was taking my keynotes and my work from my dad's office and like looking around at all of the pictures everything exactly the way he left it all the pictures of us and feeling like somehow really connected to him but also like profoundly sad that he wasn't trying to fight me for that office space. All right. So observations, great range of questions, observations about these questions and the answers. What do you notice? Yes. Um, the last question was a little broad, and it seems like it really allowed you a lot of space to kind of speak and kind of put more of your like, emotions and feelings on the Yes. Okay. So the answer was the last question was by far the most broad. And it allowed me the greatest latitude to speak at length, not just about what I did and the activities, but my thoughts, my feelings, anything I wanted to share at all. And that's because the biggest question you can ask on any occasion, and the question that you should ask first, truly, on virtually every occasion, is a kind of trick question because it doesn't look like one. And it is this. Oh, it is tell me. Do you know when we're mediating in the Columbia Law Clinic, we don't go in and say, uh, so what are your legal claims? What are your defenses? How much money are you going to pay? Right? We walk in and we say, tell us what brought you here. Because that is the question that allows that person to lead me truly to who they are and their view of the situation. You might be tempted to go into this negotiation, right, the Lawrence competition, and go in and say, here's what I'm offering, here's what we're requesting, here are the reasons why, right? Much, much better to first go in and ask the person, tell me your view of the situation. I don't know your hypothetical, right? Tell me your view of the proposal we sent over. From your perspective, tell me how things have gone last year. I got to tell you, it's also a fabulous question for negotiation, sales, and persuasion generally. I teach large sales teams at organizations around the country. I recently taught a sales team from a major television network, right? How you don't go in to a meeting with your clients who are placing ads on your network and say, here's what we have coming up this year. You know, we got this award ceremony, we got this amazing show. You go in and you say, tell me what's going on in your business this year. Because what you want to figure out is, what are the pressure points for that person? What do they need this year? What are the results that they're trying to deliver? And remember that the person is representing an institution, but they're also representing themselves. And so in addition, right, to maybe having some institutional goals, they may have problems that they're looking to solve for themselves. And if you get to know them and figure out how you're going to solve that problem, maybe before they even realize how to solve it themselves, that's when you're going to be the most effective. Tell me, first question, every occasion. And I'm telling you, even with friends and family, how many times have you come home and said to you know, a partner, a spouse, a friend, how was your day? That is a fake question, okay? How was your day or how are you is actually not a question. It's a social script. It means let's do this before we get down to talking about what we're really gonna talk about, right? We'll move through this stuff and then um, I'm gonna start negotiating. No, ask them, tell me all about your day. I'm telling you, it is remarkable how changing just a couple words at the beginning changes it into a sincere invitation. Right? So much different, even with your friendly tone, had you asked me, how was your vacation? I would have said it was great. Right? Try this and watch what happens when you negotiate. All right. Last question. Have you ever been concerned, anyone here ever been concerned about what happens if someone says no? Or maybe that's not going to work for me and all that. Okay. All right. So about 50%. And the other 50% of you just shifted uncomfortably in your seats. So that's okay. <laughs> All right. So here's the thing. No does not have to be the end of the conversation. 
but it's also not an invitation for you to argue. Remember that every action is going to have an equal and opposite reaction, right? We learn that in physics, and believe me, we learn it in mediation, right? The more I try to push someone, the more they're going to push against me, right? What they want is the agency and freedom to make their own decisions. So give it to them. Just ask them this question. Oh, what are your concerns? This proposal doesn't work for us. What are your concerns, right? I can't say yes to this at this time. What are your concerns? We can't put you on that team that you've been advocating for. Okay, tell me your concerns. This is a fantastic, sincere, open-ended invitation to somebody to share with you the barriers to the deal. And let me tell you what this question is much better than. It's much better than asking somebody why. Why don't I like why? Why begets a because. Why is a question that even if I look super friendly when I ask it, puts people on the defensive, right? It sounds like a question that calls for blame, that calls for justification, that is backward looking. Instead of saying, why don't you like it? What are your concerns? That subtle shift, you eliminate why from your negotiating behavior and replace it with what, is that you're gonna get much less defensiveness and much more information. And the key is you can't just do this as lip service. You have to sincerely then work to address those people's concerns. I'm going to tell you, I worked for years to publish a book. My book came out in May 2020. I was like, this is truly the moment I've dreamed of my whole life. And I had this gigantic tour, and most of my sales tied up with in-person events. Every single person canceled. And most of them canceled and said to me, we're not going to buy any books because we're, we're not doing a virtual event. And one by one, I called them up and I said, what are your concerns with a virtual event? And one person said to me, well, we were so swamped, we don't have the staff to run it. And I said, oh, I totally hear that. Would it help? I have staff. Would it help if we did it and set up the link and sent it to you to send around? They were like, yes, we did the event. <laughs> Second person said to me, well, we don't know if our employees would want a virtual event. And I said, that's a great question. How might we find that out? And they said, well, I suppose we could survey them. Great idea. They surveyed them. The employees wanted the event. We did the event. Right? A third was a bookstore and said, we just really don't want to do anything to self-promote right now. People in our community are suffering. And like, we only want to do stuff that's going to help the community. And I said, fine, forget a book talk. How about we do a training for small business owners and we donate money to the local food bank for every person that attends. Right? I'll, I'll kick it in. And they said, great, we did the event, we raised thousands of dollars for the food camp. I'm here to tell you that if you ask somebody their concerns, you can not only get over those concerns, but you can do it in a way that makes the person glad they worked with you. Because people, what I want you to know is no is not always about you. In fact, frequently it's not about you, right? It might be timing, it might be the person doesn't have enough information to know what you're offering. So give them the gift of asking for their objections and then honoring those objections. And I'm excited to see the kinds of deals that you're going to create. All right. So finished with questions, we're going to talk about three last strategies that you can use for this competition, but also, frankly, for life, right? And really, the purpose of this competition is to provide you a focused opportunity to practice what you are going to do every day of your life as an attorney no matter what area of the law you end up in. Okay, so first strategy I wanted to share with you is you know, not just about the substantive points you make, but how you say it, speaking with power. I teach a lot of people at Fortune 100 companies at the UN how to say words in negotiation that help instead of words that are gonna hurt you, okay? So let's talk about that. We're tempted when we go in to use the first person too much, right? I have this product, you know, I have this company. I'm here to do this. This is what I'm looking for. Do you know there's research to show that using I too much makes you come across as actually insecure and lower status, like not a leader within your organization. 
Instead, you should be heavily using we and you. Do you see the difference between I have a number of products or services I'd love to show you about them, and you do an incredible job of reaching consumers in this market, and we can work together to extend that reach and tap a market you haven't tapped in, right? We and you actually makes you come across more senior, more collaborative, more thoughtful, and definitely more persuasive. Okay, next, these last two. I think, I don't know how many of you are in here are like this, but sometimes we go in and we try to make ourselves small. I see you nodding, right? Make ourselves small to hedge, right? And we're tentative, we're, we're afraid to just kind of say the thing. And so we'll say, well, I think this proposal should meet your needs. This is you undercutting your own credibility, right? I've seen this a lot. I have even seen this with people who are extremely senior. I once mooted somebody who was going to give a job talk at an elite law school, right? This person, an expert in her field. And she got up and said, I think, I think, I think. And I said, no, you don't think. You're the expert you know, right? So instead of saying, I think this proposal should meet your needs, either replace it with I know, or better yet, just state your point. Our track record shows what we'll be able to do, period. Okay, last one, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, how many times do we say I'm sorry, right? And I wonder if there's anybody here who feels that this is a default for them, that they go to apologizing. Sometimes we apologize when it's really the other person who should apologize, right? Like somebody interrupts you and you say, I'm so sorry, I was speaking. You were interrupted, right? It's one thing if there was really a mistake or something that you need to take accountability for. Absolutely, by all means, be direct and apologize. But if this is for everyday social interactions, for you taking up space or having needs, don't say, I'm sorry, say, thank you, right? Instead of saying, I'm sorry, I can't make the meeting at that time, Thank you for your patience. Here's what I can do. Right? If you're walking into the room and you're a minute late, right? Walking and saying, oh, I'm so sorry. Right? Much better to simply thank someone for their patience. Right? One of my all-time like favorite posts on social media was a video I did of me physically deleting the I'm sorry out of somebody's email and replacing it with thank you. It accomplishes all the collaboration and civility you want without undermining your presence and your power. So if this is a thing for you, just replace I'm sorry with thank you. Okay, strategy two, it's what I call land the plane. What does that mean? It means we talk too much. <laughs> we talk in mediation or in negotiation to connect. We talk because we're nervous and we're afraid that people are gonna reject our proposal. And so we take that silence and we eat it up with our words, right? How many times have I seen someone ask a great question like, Alex, what do you need? And then almost immediately they're like, well, would $10,000 do it? Because I think, you know, we're on the low side, but I think if you look at the rest of the market, you'll see, no. Just ask your question, make your proposal, and then land the plane. Do you know, there was a recent study, very recent, um, a preprint paper out of the Journal of Applied Psychology that found that the biggest and best negotiation moves were made following a period of silence. How much silence? At least three and a half seconds. Did anybody get uncomfortable just now? A little bit, right? Okay, practice, you didn't, that's great, right? Work on that, build on that, because silence is an incredibly powerful weapon in negotiation. I can't tell how many times I've trained people and they say, Alex, I can't do this. I'm an introvert. And my response is, great. You're going to be so comfortable with silence. You know, I once, um, I was talking to a friend of mine. She's a stay-at-home mom. And she told me when my book came out, like, I'm so personally happy for you. I'll read it. But I never negotiate and I'm bad at it. And finally, she called me super excited one day. She's like, I did it. Here's what I did. So my kids go to summer camp, I work there, and their cousin came in for the week. And the camp wanted to charge me $1,000 to send the little cousin to camp along with my kids. And I really wanted a discount. 
So she calls up the head of the camp. She's like, I've worked here for many years. The kid's coming this week. What can you do? And the guy's like, oh, totally. You know, you work very hard for us. I can give you 50% off. She sits there. And he says, you know, we could, we could do more than that. We could probably give you like 75% off. You're like, two kids. And she says, hmm. And then he says, oh, what the heck? You know, you've been working here 20 years. We're going to let the kid go. Truly, a few seconds of silence, right? Silence does some powerful things. It keeps you from bidding against yourself. It actually provokes thought and introspection and collaborative problem solving in the other person. It gives them space to contemplate their moves. I'm here to tell you that, especially if you ask a great question, the other person needs time to integrate that and think of an answer. Don't step on them. Have the courage to bring the plane in for a land, right? And if you need, count three and a half seconds in your head and watch what happens. All right, last one. Oh, you're making an offer. You're making a demand. How do you do it? I know that was an unfortunate uh, skip. <laughs> All right, how do you do it? I'm here to teach you a formula that you're gonna use that is so effective for literally everything you do, okay? It is called the I we. Here's why. Research shows that requests, negotiation requests, are more favorably looked at when they are tied to a communal concern, right? So here's what I'm proposing, and here's how we both benefit. Lots of different ways you can do this, right? So you're focusing the person on what you have in common, and what they are going to gain rather than lose by working with you. I wait. Okay. If you sign a longer term agreement, here's everything that we're going to be able to do that's over and above, right? Or the investment for us is this, and here's everything that we're going to be able to do together when you are compensating us at this level, right? This, the I we, is something that most negotiators can't do. Why? because they haven't asked the questions up front to figure out the we. They're aiming indiscriminately at a target they can't see because they haven't asked the open diagnostic questions they need to be able to solve that other person's problem. You know, I teach a lot at the UN, I teach a lot around the world, and I'll never forget the transnational negotiator who said to me, who's involved with a very, very high profile, intractable conflict. And he said to me, we are never going to figure out this conflict until we learn how to write the other side's victory speech. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the other person in your negotiation going home to whatever audience they have. It could be family. If it's employment, it could be other people in the office. It could be people within their company. And figure out how they are going to be able to sell that up the chain or down the chain as a win. When you figure out how to help them do that, while also helping yourself achieve your objectives, that is when you are going to be super successful. Now, it is not always easy to do, right? Sometimes you're going to be faced with someone you really don't like. <laughs> Too soon. I'm really sorry. Right? You might even be faced with someone who you feel like is pure evil. <laughs> By the way, somebody should help this guy negotiate. I think he's going to need it this year, right? Maybe one of you could uh, help him out with this contract. But truly, most of the time, I actually want to end by talking about football. And I'm going to get off this slide because I can't really get off that one. Okay. <laughs> I want to end by talking about football. And here's why. Because I was asked in a program I did a few months ago, Professor, do you think there's always a winner and a loser in negotiation? I'm going where you're going, Professor Cole, right? And I said, um, there is sometimes. If I am on a field playing a particular game on a particular day, and both of us have the exact same objective, it's set up that way, and only one person can win, Ohio State Board, right? That is an example of a win-lose conflict. It's not like soccer where you can talk, right, and everyone can go home, right? There's a winner and a loser. Okay. Most of the time, 
life is not going to serve you up two teams on a field. It's going to serve you up a situation where you're in a kayak and Professor Cole's in a kayak and Professor Lee's in another kayak, Professor Prolix in another kayak. And we're not necessarily aiming for the same beach, right? You know, maybe you're headed for one, I'm headed for the jungle, right? You're headed for wherever it might be. And the questions you have to ask yourself at the end of the day are, not did I win or lose, but did I advance myself? How did I advance myself toward where I'm going? And how do I feel about myself at the end of the day? There are gonna be plenty of opportunities as a lawyer, as a professional, as a person, for people to define your worth from the outside and tell you whether they think you won or you lost. And I have to tell you that when I'm in a kayak, when I'm sitting in my metaphorical kayak, and I see other people, you know, pedaling really fast, maybe sometimes it looks like they're going faster than I am, and they're headed for some place, maybe they're headed for a different beach. That is not a moment for me to say, well, maybe I should head there. That is a moment for me to wave and keep heading toward my beach. Because truly, at the end of the day, asking for more, right, is not about money, and it's not about getting ahead of somebody else. It's about living a life worth living, pursuing the things that are going to bring you joy and happiness, which is also how you're going to be most successful, and being able to look at yourself in the mirror at the end. And if you can do that, if you can advance yourself toward where you need to go and feel good about yourself in the process of doing it, you're going to have a really successful competition, but you're also going to have a rich and successful professional and personal life. And that is my hope for you today. So thank you very much. to monitor them for you. I know there were some issues with the. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to see if I can see the chat, and I can't. I can only see the q and I'm not seeing any questions, but I'm going to invite the audience as well um, to ask some questions, and maybe uh, you can uh, point some out to me to hear them. All right. What questions do you guys have? Yes, ma'am. So we live in a world where a lot of people tend to not listen to women as much as men. And in negotiations or otherwise. So what do you teach your students when they go to chair mediations or negotiations that to consider um, gender? Yeah, okay, great question. So the question is roughly speaking about women in negotiation, right? What do I teach? How do I equip? Are there differences? Okay, and um, yes, right, yes. Okay, fantastic question. So I will say in general, that the approach I teach to negotiation works well for people of any gender, right? If you are coming in and you're starting with questions and listening and even summarizing, which we didn't get to talk about here today, you're going to be able to disarm a lot of, you know, fragility or hostility you may encounter out there. You know, the research on women and negotiation has evolved over time. Initially, um, Linda Babcock, who's also a Simon & Schuster author, I think you've had her here, right, Professor Cole, published a book called Women Don't Ask, finding that in some circumstances, women weren't asking, right, for things as much as their male counterparts were, right? And I think that resonated for a lot of women. And there were also women that, says, that said, why is this our fault, right? And indeed, there's been research that's come out since then that in other contexts, right, specifically in the workplace in this one study or two, that women did ask as much as men, they just didn't receive. And in some cases, they were penalized for asking, right, because of uh, internalized uh, sexism within the institution. Okay. So I would say, um, first of all, there are certain things that I teach, especially for women. Um, the I-we strategy that I showed you earlier has been proven by research to be exceptionally helpful as a woman if you are navigating in a space 
where you feel there is extra pressure to be collaborative, right? That as a woman, it's it's um, you're going to get penalized if you use I too much, right? And and let's face it, for a lot of women in the workplace, we feel like we're kind of walking a tightrope. Like on the one side, it's like Alex is too nice; she doesn't really have leadership potential. And on the other side, it's like Alex is too aggressive or abrasive or aggressive, right? Those delightful ones. Um, a lot of women in this room probably have been called aggressive at least once in their life. I certainly have. Okay. And may I say also that for women of color, it's often two tight ropes, right? That you might be navigating stereotypes based not only on your gender, but on your race or ethnicity, right? And so it can be doubly hard. The I we is incredibly effective. I would say also you can use an I we when you are claiming credit or claiming your expertise. It's critically important as women, you know, negotiation is not just how you talk to other people. It includes how you talk to yourself and how you talk about yourself. And being able to describe what you have accomplished, right? And your areas of expertise is critical to your success as you get more senior. It's critical to all of you, right? But research shows that women are slightly more hesitant to say that. Again, I say, use an I we, right? Go in and say, I'm incredibly proud to have led this team. And I wanna take a moment to shout out everybody who contributed to this result and thank you for your support, right? So you are accurate, you are claiming credit, but you are also, right, being collaborative and talking about uh, everybody. You know, I, I would say the last piece of research I wanna leave you with about women in negotiation was a recent study that I found really depressing. And it shows that the gender gap in negotiation starts at age eight. They set up a study where kids were asking adults for stickers. There was no upper limit on the number of stickers they could ask for. The girls, when they were asking an adult woman for stickers, asked for just as much as the little boys. When they were asking an adult man, they somehow asked for fewer stickers. No upper limit, right? age eight. And so part of what I say when I'm counseling women around the globe, especially if you're looking to model, you know, for the people who are younger than you, it's really not as much what you say, it's more what you do. You know, my hope is that my daughter, in addition to everything that I've taught her, she's 10. My hope is that she's going to watch mom go out and unapologetically inhabit her space and negotiate for herself. And that she's going to grow up in a world where she can Thank you for that question. Excellent. Who else? Yes. So one of the things you talked about is you know, asking people about their concerns. Yeah. And, and some people are better than others at articulating what those concerns might be. Okay. What's your follow up if the person says, you know, I don't really have any concerns or I don't know, I don't know what I, I don't know what's wrong, but I just don't like it. You just don't like it. Okay, that is fabulous. So the person has said, um, I don't know what my concerns are. Um, I just don't like it. The first thing I think I would do is I would go back to the listening that I have done throughout. Because um, oftentimes people are going to tell you, maybe not with their words, but with their face, about what they don't like about them. Right? I, you know, there are a number of times when I'm reading deal terms to somebody out loud and you can see even with a mask on, I'm here to tell you guys, right here, right, this circle between your eyes, your forehead, and your nose, I've actually learned this because my dad is nonverbal in hospice, and they said that you can tell his emotional state and how comfortable he is right here, or if he's in pain, and you will see somebody's brow contract and furrow, right, if something doesn't work for them. So the first thing I might say is, you know, Sarah, I hear you telling me like you're not sure. I, I do have to say that when we were talking about the timeline, that your your words were telling me everything was fine, but your face was telling me I didn't quite have it, right? Talk to me, right? And see if I can open it up there. Another route I might try is um, addressing some of their underlying concerns. Sometimes people won't tell me their concern because they're not sure they can trust me. So I might say, you might be wondering, 
if you can trust me with your concern. You might be wondering if I'm just out here for myself and I'm not interested in doing something that's going to work for you. And I want to tell you here that I don't win unless you do. Like, I'm here to truly do something that works for both of us, right? And, and I want to honor your concern. And then silence. Last thing I would do is I would just stay silent after they said that because it might be three and a half seconds later that they're going to come up with something that um, they people often say the thing that's really been on their mind. In fact, I would use this frankly as a litigator in deposition. Um, I would ask people a question, they'd give me the answer, and I would pause for like five seconds or more. I've been trained as a mediator, I'm like, I can sit here all day. And um, very often then is when they would cough up the thing that was on their mind that they couldn't say. Yeah. Yeah. You had a question from Zoom. From, from Zoom. Thanks, Alex. This is wonderful. A question from T. Alley. Uh, how do you find a win win when you are in two different kayaks? And one of those high kayaks has a high conflict personality rating. Ah, okay. So how do I steer when the other person is like creating some waves, right? <laughs> um, they're making it real choppy. Okay. I return to the things I know how to do best, which is um, to really, really listen and not just to what they say, but um, to their whole body. I'll give you an example. Okay. During COVID, you know, we normally in Columbia, we get cases that are ordered to mediate in front of us. So judges send people to mediation, right? And most people approach it with relatively good humor, right? The judge has ordered it, right? They're going to go, they make the most. Okay, COVID hits, people are stressed, let me tell you. And I got this one party, a lawyer actually, who was ordered to mediate in front of me, and she was extremely unhappy. She sent me a series of the spiciest emails I've ever received in my like, you know, almost 20 years of mediating, basically saying, I don't think you have authority to do this. What is your program anyway? What are your qualifications? She then sent back my agreement to mediate, which is a standard agreement, just saying, you know, we're not your lawyer and this is confidential, marked it all up and was like, I'm not going to sign it. Okay. Meanwhile, the judge has ordered her to be there. So the judge is on standby. As we get onto the mediation, I tried to talk to her in advance. She was like, listen, I'm not talking to you before the mediation. I'm ordered to be there, so I'm going to be there. See you at the mediation, right? She basically gave me the Italian speech. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm Italian. She, she was not. Okay. So um, we show up on the mediation. This is the first time we're seeing each other, right? And I can see she's mad. She doesn't want to be there. And we're there with our smiling faces. And the other party wasn't there yet. Here's what happened in the first 90 seconds of that mediation. I saw her do several things, right? She first fumbled with the Zoom buttons. And she was like, oh God, am I muted? I'm not sure. I just downloaded this. I don't know how to do it, okay? So the second thing she did was to make a motion that as a mother, I recognized immediately. It was to whoever shares her home being white, take the kids out and I'm gonna be here at four o'clock. Maybe four o'clock, okay? Mommy loves you, bye bye, okay? She did that. Third thing she did was flustered. She like pulled her papers in and she was like, I, you know, hopefully I have her. And I stopped for a second. I said, can I make a guess about something? Right, this was before we were about to get to the agreement to mediate, okay? I was like, can I make a guess about something? Here's my guess. So three weeks ago, you got an order from a judge that you've never practiced in front of before because you're from a different region of the country to mediate with a program you've never heard of before with a mediator you've never heard of or met before. And that mediator asks you to download a software program that you haven't used before. And you have to arrange for childcare for your family. And on top of that, with three weeks notice, you've got to assemble all of these documents. Did I get it right? Or was there another way that I messed up your life these last three weeks that I haven't covered? She laughs and she says, nope, I think you pretty much got it. Smile. She signed the agreement with no modification. We mediated the case. She found it profoundly helpful. We settled. She wrote us a LinkedIn testimonial, unprompted, about the service she received. In the end, it's about recognizing people's humanity, even if it's Jim Harbaugh, leaning in, 
right? And trying to see the humanity behind the position. That's my best strategy. We are at 115. Thank you so much for joining us here today.